Hello, this is a short teaching video for a study that is taking place in our emergency department. We want to investigate the impact of focused cardiac ultrasound criteria to the Canadian syncope risk score. We will look for those four precise elements, severely depressed left ventricular function, severe aortic stenosis, clinically significant pericardial effusion, and right ventricular strain in the context of possible pulmonary embolism. We want to generate those four cardiac views, the parasternal long and short axis views, the four chambers, and the subdiscipoid view. We will review quickly those four views and how to generate them. For the parasternal long axis view, you will put the cardiac phase array probe with cardiac preset. The probe will be applied parasternally, marker pointing towards patient right shoulder. You want to have in your screen the section of the heart where you can identify the mitral valve and the mid portion of the left ventricle. For the personal short axis view, you will then rotate your probe 90 degrees towards patient left shoulder to obtain a good view of the papillary muscles as well as the left ventricle uh, that looks circular. The four chambers view will be generated moving your probe towards uh, the apex of the heart, marker pointing towards patient left side. Your image is going to show all four cavities, including both atriums and both ventricles. The subcephoid view will be generated by moving the probe just below the cephoid process, pointing towards the heart. We will review what images we expect to have with a normal heart. We can see here a normal personal long axis view. Here is a normal personal short axis view showing a good left ventricular systolic contraction. We now see a normal four chambers view. And a normal subcephoid view as well. Let's start with what, we, uh, with what we want to identify for our syncope patients. We want to know if our patient has severely depressed left ventricular function that could be causing the syncope presentation. To define severely depressed left ventricular function, we use two criteria. The fractional shortening should be measured at the level of the papillary muscles and at the end of systole and diastole to see if there is a change of less than 30% using an eyeballing method. The second criteria is the E-point septal separation. Uh, it's the distance between the anterior mitral valve leaflet and the interventricular septum in the personal long view uh, during diastole. A value over one centimeter is one of the criteria for severe left ventricular dysfunction that can be visually estimated as well. Here is um, a parasternal long axis view. Uh, we can identify, uh, we can see that the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve clearly does not come close to the interventricular wall, and the fractional shortening does not show a significant change in diameter between systole and diastole. It is certainly less than 30% in change of diameter measured at the level of the papillary muscles. In this parasternal short axis view at the level of the papillary muscles, we see a fractional shortening of less than 30% between systole and diastole. Here's a four chamber view uh, showing again severely depressed left ventricular function. And the subcephoid view showing the same severely depressed left ventricular function. The second cardiac structural anomaly we want to look, uh, to look for is severe aortic stenosis. Absence of severe aortic stenosis will be defined as seeing movement of one aortic valve cusp in either the parasternal long axis view or the parasternal short axis view. Here we see a parasternal long axis view showing the aortic valve cusp movements. We can also look at the valve itself, a thin white line. This aortic valve is normal. In the parasternal short axis view, the aortic valve will look like a circular echoic structure where you will see the movement of the cusp opening and closing. To, visual the, to visualize the aortic valve in the parasternal short axis, we want to generate the, that same short axis view with only a small modification in the probe positioning. 
you will need to tilt the probe just a bit towards patient's chest wall to look for that aortic valve. This is a parasternal short axis view showing the opening and closing of the aortic valve with normal cusp movements. Here is a parasternal long axis view of the aortic valve showing some movement of the aortic valve excluding a severe aortic valve stenosis. We can see though that the valve is thickened looking hyperechoic compared to, uh, compared to a normal aortic valve. In this parasternal shirt axis view, the cusp are moving. We can still see that this valve is thickened. This is a parasternal long axis view showing no cusp movement of the thickened aortic valve. In this parasternal shirt axis view, the cusp don't move. The third anomaly we want to look for is uh, clinically significant pericardial effusion. The reason why we decided to use the word clinically is because in the context of syncope, a small pericardial effusion might be clinically significant if you think your patient is having an aortic uh, dissection. In another context, a large pericardial effusion for a patient receiving chemotherapy, for example, presenting with syncope, may be as clinically significant as the small pericardial effusion of a dissecting aorta. Let's review a few images. This parasternal long axis view shows a pericardial effusion that appears as a black stripe pointed by the big arrow between the left ventricle and the descending aorta, showed by the smaller arrow, a circular black structure posterior to the heart. In this parasternal short axis view, we see the same black stripe posterior to the left ventricle wall. In this forward chambers view, we can identify a pericardial effusion at the apex and at the base of the right atrium. The subsivoid view is a great view to look for a pericardial effusion. We can see um, the pericardial effusion both anteriorly and posteriorly in this clip. The fourth anomaly we want to look for is a right ventricular strain that we could see with a pulmonary embolism causing syncope. To define right ventricular strain, we use two criteria. The presence of one of these two is sufficient to make the diagnosis of right ventricular dysfunction. Using the four chambers view, we need to see that the right ventricle is bigger than the left ventricle in size, which is abnormal, and or that the tapsy is less than one centimeter be between systole and diastole. TAPC stands for a tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion and is a, it's a measure that helps identify right ventricular dysfunction. If the movement of the tri tricuspid annulus is less than one centimeter between systole and diastole, the right, ventricle, uh, the right ventricular dysfunction is considered severe. Here's a parasternal long axis view in a patient with a right ventricular strain. The heart is hyperdynamic. Here is a four chambers view showing a right ventricle um, that is bigger in size than the left ventricle, a sign of right ventricular dysfunction. It's in this view that we can look at the TAPC as well. In this case, there is movement of the tricuspid annulus, but it is diminished, moving approximately um, one centimeter between systole and diastole. Here is the subcivoid view of the same patient. The size of the right ventricle uh, should be evaluated using only the four chambers view though. And with an IVC view, we can see that there is limited variation of the IVC diameter uh, with this patient's breathing. The focus for syncope patients pilot study will need your help to, then, to identify these four structural cardiac anomalies. It's a great way to do a thorough evaluation of your syncope patients in DED and help narrow down the possible etiologies for their clinical presentation. Don't forget to register your clips and QPath under the ED syncope worksheet so we can actually include your patients in our study. 
in the classification column, there is a beautiful syncope study title that you can add so we will know that you recruited a patient. Thank you very much for your time.